Shalom, and thank you for listening to sermons from Tikvat Israel, a Messianic synagogue in the heart of Richmond, Virginia. Listening to the podcast is great, but we would love to meet you in person. All are welcome, and that includes you. So if you want the full experience, please join us Saturday mornings at 10 a.m. for our worship service at the corner of Arthur Ashe Boulevard and Grove in the historic synagogue across from the art museum. Can't make it in person? No problem. We are also live streaming on YouTube. Contact our administrator at tikvatdirector at gmail.com for the link during the week or contact us on our website, tikvatisrael.com. There, you can also support the ministry, learn more about Messianic Judaism, and find helpful resources. May Hashem bless you through the hearing of His Word. Avinu Shabbat our Father in Heaven, we pray that your Word would go forth and encourage your community this morning. And in Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. If you've listened to a few of my sermons, you may have noticed that I am fond of sandwiches. My first sermon on the subject was how the tabernacle stories around the golden calf debacle creates a nice God-dwelling-among-Israel sandwich. Okay, so in the book of Exodus, you have the instructions for the tabernacle. Then you have, we worship the golden calf. That was like, you know, the worst. It was not good. And then you have all the actual building of the tabernacle. It's like chapter after chapter. So I said, well, this is kind of like a sandwich. So even God likes a nice sandwich, right? So I'm not not alone in this. Then a while back, I asked this important question, if a hot dog was a sandwich, right? So we discussed that, and uh, we encouraging us to walk in our unique calling and to to be a hot dog. That was my main my main point. And if you are curious about that, it's on our on our podcast. If you want to listen to those messages. So, in light of these essential sandwich related topics today, I thought we could begin with another very important question: What else goes on a peanut butter sandwich? The reason I'm asking this is because it's an okay sandwich by itself, right? We, maybe some of us have had just peanut butter, right? But it's, it's better if it's got something else, right? Because if the peanut butter is on there, what happens? It sticks to the roof of your mouth, right? It can be a problem, uh, and it's just better if it has something to go with it. So I looked up the most popular combos. I think I left, I did leave one out. I'm sorry, Gordon. Apparently in New England, they like marshmallow fluff, so I'm sorry, uh, that's not an option. (laughs) Who is booing? (laughs) All right, I didn't realize how controversial this would be. All right, what we're going to do is actually we're going to take a survey. So if you look up here, you can use this QR code and take a survey, or you can go to menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com, and use this code, those numbers, and we're all going to vote right now. Okay, so take a moment to vote on your favorite thing to go with a peanut butter sandwich. And there is an option, if you just think it should be peanut butter, just, you know, do that. All right, raise your hand if you have voted already. Okay, that's good enough. All right, let's take a look at, see if we can look at the results, Gordon. These are the real-time results. All right, so we got six votes for jelly. That seems to be in the lead. One for Nutella, four for banana, three, two for honey, two for apples, zero for pickles. That's a surprise. No, no pregnant ladies out there. And then, uh, and then nothing, nothing just the PB is zero. Okay, so we all like something, a little something on there. That is interesting. Okay. Well, today, peanut butter is an analogy for your story. And telling your story or a slice of your story can be an awesome way to share the gospel. Gospeling and sharing how God intervened in your story go together like, um, you got it, peanut butter and jelly. I wanted to share from uh, Rabbi Stuart Dowerman he wrote a book called Eat This Book on sharing his, uh, sharing, well, the, the whole 
book is, is more about discipleship, but this chapter is about sharing your faith. And uh, Rabbi Stewart borrows from the food metaphor throughout the book, so I thought it, was, it would be perfect for us. And uh, here it, he applies it to missions, and this is what he says. Quote, Chefs and restaurateurs take pride not only in the food they serve, but in how it is presented, how it looks on the plate, how pleasing the meal is to the eye even before it passes the palate test. These professionals will be quick to remind us that how the meal is presented is just as important as the meal itself. The same is true of serving Yeshua's good news to our friends. The message may be true food for the soul, but it won't be appetizing or enjoyable until and unless we pay attention to how it is presented. That's what we are looking at in this chapter. Let's begin then with the principle of good news presentation. People will only care about your explanations when they covet your experiences. Sharing your experiences with God is like an appetizer for the meal of the good news. We need to first serve our friends a slice of life with God. This means sharing one or more stories from our own life, which will cause our friend to think, maybe you have encountered God in a way that I haven't. Each of these stories is a slice of life with God. We are talking about storytelling. Advertisers tell stories. Movies tell stories. The Bible is stuffed with stories. It is the universal and ancient way of talking about what's important, unquote. Thank you, Rabbi Stewart. Moving to today's Parsha in Deuteronomy, the Torah says there are many, many things that can pair with a story which make it that much better. How many of you have ever shared a testimony or something that God has done for you, shared it with somebody else? Okay. Well, the Torah wants to instruct us today as to how we can zazz it up. It's peanut butter and honey and banana, baby. All right, bada bing. You ready to zazz it up? I didn't hear you. You ready to zazz it up? Okay. So let's dive right into the Parsha in Deuteronomy 26, starting in verse 1. When you have come to the land Adonai your God is giving you, as your inheritance, taken possession of it and settled there, you are to take the first fruits of all the crops the ground yields, which you will harvest from your land that Adonai your God is giving you, put them in a basket, and go to the place where Adonai your God will choose to have his name live. You will approach the, the Kohen, or priest, holding office at the time, and say to him, Today I declare to Adonai your God that I have come to the land Adonai swore to our ancestors he would give us. The Kohen will take the basket from your hand and put it down in front of the altar of Adonai your God. Then, in the presence of Adonai your God, you are to say, okay, we'll get to that which you will say in a moment. That's the peanut butter. But let's look at the setup. When we come to the land that Adonai has given us, we are to take the first part of our bounty and bring it to the priest before the Lord. It is in this context that we are to tell our testimony. In other words, our story, gospeling, goes along with what? An offering, which is our worship. Gospeling and offering sounds almost as melodic as PB&J, doesn't it? Right? PB&J, gospeling and offering. Yeah, it sounds nice. Worshiping the Lord and giving a testimony go together. Here is a testimony from MAPS Global, a local Richmond ministry that establishes houses of prayer and worship all over the world, especially in places that are typically resistant to the good news about Yeshua. This I got from their website. Quote, in Psalm 22.3, David writes, yet you are holy enthroned on the praises of Israel. Five times a day, the atmosphere of the Middle East is constantly filled with false worship to a false god. But as the bride of Christ lifts her song in day and night worship and prayer, a throne is being built for the Lord to inhabit the praises of his people. Why is it important that we come in with a priestly ministry, asked the director of our Middle East mission space. I mean, the simple answer for me would be that we are seeing Psalm 22.3 fulfilled. We're watching it happen. The Lord is holy. He inhabits the praises of his people. And that word for enthroned means to be seated upon or enthroned upon. So when we're worshiping, we're building a seat in the spirit. The worship being lifted up through Islam, Buddhism, and Hinduism goes into the atmosphere. But the worship being lifted up by believers goes right into the throne room. 
Revelation 5, 8 states, When he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. We see our cry, our worship, our prayer is coming like incense before the throne, said the believer in the Middle East. Since the beginning of time, he has been surrounded by worship. When a throne of worship is built for the one who has all authority in heaven and on earth, he comes and rests in that place, and his presence fills that place. When the Holy One comes, darkness flees. When we have his presence, we have everything. It's more important than strategies, systems, and programs. Those are all great things, but we need the presence of God. In the Middle East, the 50 hours event is said to be like Acts 16. In Acts 16, Paul and Silas were in a dark prison. However, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open, and everyone's chains came loose. Years ago, there was a young man who is now a big part of the praying community of believers in the Middle East, who was basically dragged into the prayer room by his brother. He did not want to be there. By his own admission, he looked around and judged everyone, wondered why everyone was worshiping so boldly. As he sat there, he wondered why they were standing, singing, and dancing. He could not wait to leave. Then all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit's presence came upon him, and he began shouting in tongues. He began praising God. In that moment, his life changed forever. He went from being an unbeliever to stepping into full-time ministry. He is now one of the most zealous and passionate young men at the Middle East Mission Space. He has been walking out his salvation for the past two years, unquote. So the essential message is that worshiping God, bringing our offering, goes with gospeling so that it's not just peanut butter. In other words, worship and praise can change the atmosphere to enable God's kingdom to advance. We're not just gathering this morning to sing a few songs and a few prayers. We are part of moving God's kingdom forward. We know that the peanut butter sandwich alone gets stuck on the roof of your mouth, but a peanut butter testimony with something else, like jelly, right? Now we're talking. Now you've got something, okay? As we worship the Lord, as we pray and come together, he makes a way for our stories of faithfulness to have a greater impact on those that are far from God. So let's check out uh, now the testimony, the peanut butter, from Deuteronomy. So he's saying, bring your offering to the priest and then say this to the priest. This is Deuteronomy starting in verse 5 uh, from chapter 26. Then in the presence of Adonai your God you are to say... My ancestor was a nomad from Aram. He went down into Egypt, few in number, and stayed. There he became a great, strong, populous nation. But the Egyptians treated us badly. They oppressed us and imposed harsh slavery on us. So we cried out to Adonai, the God of our ancestors. Adonai heard us and saw our misery, toil, and oppression. And Adonai brought us out of Egypt with a strong hand and an outstretched arm, with great terror and with signs and wonders. Now he has brought us to this place and given us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Therefore, as you see, I have now brought the first fruits of the land which you, Adonai, have given me. Then you are to put the basket down before Adonai your God, prostrate yourself before Adonai your God, and take joy in all the good that Adonai your God has given you, your household, the Levi, and the foreigner living with you. Let's leave the, the scripture up there for a moment, please. Uh, the ancestor here, it says, my ancestor was a nomad, is most likely Jacob. The adjectives used to describe him and Israel in the first few verses are interesting. Um, this is, uh, it says, in this version it says he was a nomad, and in some versions it says he was a wandering Aramean. The word for wandering is also, um, uh, could be translated, he was destroyed or he was annihilated. It's a very strong adjective. Jacob was almost wiped out, and he went into Egypt. How did he go into Egypt? Small, right? Small and insignificant, but he came out how? Came out strong. He came out with multitudes. Notice that the land also is flowing with milk and honey, which means that a great pairing with peanut butter is honey followed by a nice glass of milk. No? Okay. Uh, but the testimony brings out the goodness of God. 
the rescuing of God and the inability of Jacob or Israel to do this for themselves. Do we see anything praising how great Jacob was? No, <laughs> he was insignificant. He was, he was uh, languishing, right? And the Lord brought him out, right? Uh, and remember, this Israelite, what are they doing when they say this? They're holding the first fruits of their land, right? They're reminding themselves, how did I get this, right? How did I get this, this, this bounty? Where did I come from? I came from, from Jacob, right? and now I'm here, and God brought us out of Egypt and into the promised land. God has done so much. I want us also to check out the phrase signs and wonders, right? What are these? These are marvels. These are divine moments, things that can only be done by God. And this, too, goes along with our gospeling, with our sharing of our stories. In the book Intimacy with God, Randy Clark shares a testimony of one of his students. I'm going to quote from that. On my second trip to India, I encountered a situation that challenged my theology pertaining to healing. At the time of this trip, I believed that healing was a byproduct of faith. I thought that it was a benefit offered to believers and was subsequent to justification, saving faith. While on my trip, one of the local pastors invited me to come with him to a village where I was asked to share my testimony, share the gospel, and offer an opportunity for unbelievers to accept Christ. After sharing my testimony and completing the, my gospel presentation, I asked if anyone wanted to accept Jesus. No one responded. I was disheartened by the lack of interest, but just as we were about to thank them for their time and to dismiss ourselves, one of the people came forward and said, please pray for me. I am deaf in my left ear and almost deaf in my right ear. I thought to myself, God, should I pray healing over someone who did not accept an invitation to follow you? If they did did not have faith to accept Jesus, they could not possibly have faith for Jesus to heal them. But oddly, I felt the Lord impress upon me to pray for his healing. I must admit that at this point I lacked faith for his healing and felt that the man's faith was minimal at best. But regardless, we prayed. No sooner had I said the words, come Holy Spirit, the man began to squint as if pain and then grabbed grabbed his ear as if in pain and then grabbed his ears with both hands immediately his eyes popped open and he looked around the room in shock I didn't know if his condition was better or worse then all of a sudden he shouted in his native tongue I can hear everyone in the room cheered and then he ran out of the room I was very confused I wanted to lead him to the person who had healed him Jesus but he ran out before we could talk in a matter of two minutes the man returned with a friend who was also deaf he said, pray for her, she's deaf too. We prayed and opened her, e and her ears opened as well. They both ran out and went to retrieve another person who was deaf. God opened the third person's ears as well. In a matter of 10 minutes, God had healed three people who did not believe in Jesus or originally have faith for Jesus to heal them. And as previously stated, my faith was minimal at best. So what was going on? At that point, the Indian pastor began to speak. He talked for five minutes in their language. While I did not know what he was saying, I could tell that they were engaged. They were all nodding their heads in agreement. When finished, he looked at me and said, they are now ready to accept Jesus. I said, which ones? He said, all of them, unquote. My own sense of Yeshua's realness also came with signs, not as dramatic perhaps as the ones in this story, but still real and valid. Christians spoke into my life in a way that I sensed that God was real. This was back in college. They always seemed to know exactly what was in my heart, and these were Christians that I knew and Christians that I didn't know, random people on buses and trains that were able to speak into my life. One time, I said a little prayer. Uh, I'm going to put that in quotes. Um, because I was tired of God bothering me. I said, Lord, could you just... Leave me alone for like 24 hours. Just give me a break. And well, folks, God responded to that prayer, but not in the way that I wanted. So I said that quote-unquote prayer, and then I walked into the campus center. Now, this is an extremely secular university. So I walk in there, and there's a guy sitting there surrounded by Bibles and biblical literature. And I was just like, I looked up, and I was like, really? You're not... <laughs> You know, you're not going <laughs> to let me go. And, um, and I ended up talking to him, and it was, you know, the Lord showed me some things. But it was just, that was a sign. It was a sign for me 
right, from heaven, that the Lord was after me, right, that God intervenes in, in our lives, that he is real. When I was wrestling with the idea that Yeshua was the Messiah in college, folks were, were praying for me, and so I encountered these signs and wonders, and uh, so I know that they're real. The presence of God to heal, restore, to speak words of knowledge, the, these followers of Yeshua were speaking into my life in a way I didn't have to explain it, right? And I say, well, this is what's going on. They were like this. They just spoke it, and it was like it pierced my heart because the Lord was <laughs> was in it, right? These are these are the signs and wonders that the Lord does. It could be as simple as speaking the right word at the right time, and it could be as dramatic as someone's eyes being healed from blindness. But it's the Holy Spirit that makes the difference. And this is what goes along with us sharing our testimonies, sharing the gospel and these things like that, right? It's the power of God, right, that goes with us in order to demonstrate that he is real. Let's take uh, one more look at the end of that passage uh, from Deuteronomy. You are to put the basket down before Adonai your God, prostrate yourself before Adonai your God, and take joy in all the good that Adonai your God has given you, your household, the Levi, and the foreigner living with you. What do I see in this passage? I see joy, I see love, and I see unity. Unity with the Kohen, Right? With the Levi, with the priest, and unity with who? The foreigner. Right? That's the Gentile. That's the resident alien that was living with Israel. Right? There's unity there. Unity is a big deal. It's, it's a major theme of the Bible. And I could cite many different verses of Scripture to this point, but I'm just going to share one of them. This is from Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 6. And it also contains the joy and the love that we saw in the Torah passage, I think. Therefore, I, the prisoner united with the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Always be humble, gentle, and patient, bearing with one another in love, and making every effort to preserve the unity of the Spirit um, that gives through the binding power of shalom. Some verses say the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as when you were called, you were called to one hope. And there is one Lord, one trust, one immersion, one God, the Father of all, who rules over all, works through all, and is in all. In other words, we're all God's children, so we need unity. This is an important part of gospeling. Unity with one another, as well as unity with the Lord himself, right? Right? because we are connected to the vine, right? We are in him as he is in, in uh, one with the Father. So to sum up, it's great to share what God has done for you, right? But if that's all you're doing, right, that's just peanut butter. Let's zazz it up a little bit, okay? It's better to add worship and prayer. It's better to add signs and wonders, the presence of God. It's better to add unity, love, joy, and peace. And there may be some things that I've left out, right? I, as I said, Gordon said, where's the, where's the peanut butter, where's the marshmallow fluff, right, for, for the peanut butter? And I said, I didn't know about that because I'm not from New England, okay? But there may be other, <laughs> there may be other things that I've, that I've left off here, that, that, um, and I would love to hear from you in terms of things that can go with our testimony to zazz it up. So please feel free to share that with me um, after service. And I want to encourage all of us to incorporate these things to make our sandwich really robust. If you, if you pursue these things, then you've got a real kingdom of God sandwich that can really feed Israel and the nations. Amen. Avinu, our Father, thank you for uh, your delicious word um, and uh, the fact that you provide for us and you sustain us moment by moment. And you are the true food. And we pray that uh, you would help us when we share our stories to, uh, and, and testimonies of your faithfulness and, and your gospel to include within that uh, the seeking of your face, the seeking of your presence um, and worshiping you, to include within that prayers for, for signs and wonders, for the reality of your kingdom to be manifest 
and to, uh, to work and pray for uh, love and joy and unity um, that uh, they will know we are your followers by our love. And uh, help us, Lord, that uh, we can be a part of your kingdom advancing uh, here in Richmond and, uh, and all over, and especially in the land of Israel. And in Yeshua's name we pray. Amen.